Okay, uh, we're going to continue on here. Uh, whatever chapter it is, 12, I think. Yeah. So uh, last time we were uh, talking about uh, bonding and more specifically drawing Lewis uh, structures. Remember uh, that when we draw Lewis structures, there's really several steps that you want to follow when you go about drawing these structures. Uh, which is uh, you want to really count up the number of valence electrons. And as we talked about, that's really important because uh, that is the exact amount of electrons that you need to have uh, when you are doing <clears throat> uh, a picture. The next thing is sort of the logical arrangement. Remember that's the least electronegative. Uh, atoms are usually in the center. So you want to put those guys in the center. Uh, in most cases, everything else will sort of be attached to it. Um, and then what you want to do is basically one you know, single bond to everybody on the outside. Uh, if you still have electrons, then they should go as pairs along here until each of the outside ones are filled up. At that point, if you still have electrons to go, then they should go to the center atom also as pairs as well. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? Last thing we do want to check is obviously um, everybody has met the octet rule. If they have not met doctor rule, that's really where we want to do double bonds or triple bonds. Again, as we talked about, we really don't want to double bond or triple bond right out of the box. Um, it usually won't lead you to sort of the correct structure. Uh, you also want to think about the electrons as sort of belonging to everybody there. You want to kind of evenly distribute them. Um, and again, not that, you know, one atom has a certain number of elements and things of that nature. Uh, any questions on Lewis structures there? <clears throat> we also talked about a couple of exceptions to the octet rule. Um, and the three sort of exceptions to the octet rule, uh, one's an incomplete octet. So really boron, for example, uh, is perfectly fine with less than eight around it. Typically boron will go like six. Uh, there's also odd number of electrons, so there are some things that will have an unpaired electron. Uh, and then the one that I talked about that, you know, you'll probably see the most in sort of your chemistry career, uh, in addition to the incomplete octet, is most likely going to be the expanded octet. And the expanded octet are ones that can go to more than eight electrons around them. And that's really, thank you, that's really uh, where sulfur is on the periodic table. Um, to the left and to the right and sort of down where the nonmetals are. Um, that's because that is where the D orbitals sort of start. Uh, so they do have the ability to stash all the extra electrons in those D orbitals. <clears throat> any questions on any of that stuff we talked about last time? Okay. So we're going to talk here now about molecular geometry and molecular geometry describes sort of the uh, three-dimensional arrangement of the atoms in space, also the electrons. Uh, we're going to talk about really two types of geometry as we go through this. One is sometimes referred to as the electron pair geometry. An electron pair geometry basically describes how the electron pairs are arranged around the central atom. So when we do geometry, as we'll talk about, pretty much it's all really based upon the central atom is really the most important one um, that you want to look at. The other ones sometimes referred to as the molecular geometry. And is sometimes also referred to as sort of the shape of the molecule as well. Now, in certain cases, as we will see, both of those names will be the same. Uh, in other cases, they will be some different names. Uh, but the molecular shape or geometry is uh, pretty much how the actual whole molecule basically ends up looking as a result of really what types of electrons are around. So let's get into that. 
So molecular geometry refers to that three-dimensional arrangement. Um, we can use our Lewis structure to help us sort of predict uh, the geometry. Uh, but really what we're looking at is kind of, again, the central atom. And it's really two things that most of the time people look at, how many electron pairs there are and how many bonds. So those are the two sort of important things that really determine sort of the overall shape of... Uh, of that particular molecule. <clears throat> now, the basis of this idea is that obviously what holds together these bonds are electrons and electrons being shared. And since electrons are negatively charged, frankly, they do not want to be near each other because they have the same charge. So what ends up happening is they do try to escape each other, uh, but they can't really go too far because they are kind of locked into a bond. So what ends up happening is, depending on the types of electrons that are present, uh, the molecule will kind of move a little bit more, kind of bend a little bit more to allow everybody to try to get enough space between the electrons where they're sort of happy sitting. Uh, and, you know, they're not going to be super happy, but because of that repulsion uh, force, they will try to sort of spread out from one another. So the model of bonding that we follow here is the valence model which is sometimes referred to as the valence shell electron pair repulsion model or vespa or which is why well, it's probably uh abbreviated there um and it accounts for the geometrical arrangement of electrons around the central atom and the overall repulsion forces that occur there's really two types of categories of molecules that we do geometry for one is where the central atom has no lone pairs so remember, lone pairs are non-bonding electrons. So that means pretty much your central atom is all bonds. There's no dots on it when you draw your Lewis structure. The other one is where you do end up with some lone pairs on the central atom. Uh, so in that case, when you draw your Lewis structure, you got maybe one pair of dots, maybe two pairs of dots or more. Uh, but you do have some dots around the central atom. So depending on whether or not there are non-bonding electron or lone pairs on a central atom will affect really the geometry of the molecule as we do get different types of electrons. Two really important considerations when you're doing geometry and when you're only doing geometry is you count all double bonds and triple bonds as one electron pair and also one bond. So kind of like what we talked about the other day in lab, when we're kind of doing the steric number and all that good stuff. Um, <clears throat> when you're counting up electron pairs and counting up bonds for geometry, doesn't matter if it's a single bond, double bond or triple bond, they all count as one bond and they all count as one electron pair. So they're effectively all working as sort of one unit uh, in the geometry here. <clears throat> The uh, second one there is not super important other than if you do draw some resonance structures, uh, you can pretty much apply this geometry to any of the structures and they will all come out the same basically. So you'll get the same sort of geometry for all those guys. They should pretty much come out the same in most cases. All right, so let's start with really the sort of simplest geometry you could have. And the simplest and easiest geometry you could have is what is referred to as a diatomic molecule. That pretty much means there is only two things attached to each other. So there's only two atoms, could be the same atom, could be different atoms, could be a double bond, could be a triple bond. It doesn't really matter. The only way to arrange two points is between a straight line. So the geometry of any diatomic molecule will always be linear. So those are pretty easy. Like I said, it doesn't matter if you're same element, different element, double, triple, single bond. If you just see two atoms there and a diatomic molecule and you want the geometry, the geometry is linear. Basically a straight line between them is basically how they will always be arranged. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> when we get three or more atoms involved, there's a couple of things that we want to look at when trying to determine sort of the geometries. And what we want to look at is the central atom and two things, which is 
how many electron pairs there are, and how many bonds. So let's take a look at an example here. When we look at this uh, Lewis structure here, the electrons on the chlorine aren't drawn, but it's not important. It is always the central atom that we want to look at. And in this particular case, there's two things we want to determine. We want to determine the number of electron pairs and the number of bonds. So in this particular case, the central atom has two electron pairs and it actually has two bonds. So those are the two electron pairs and two bonds. And they are both right about here, obviously. Two electron pairs and two bonds right there. Now, something with two electron pairs and really the number of electron pairs around the central atom will determine what is referred to as the electron pair geometry. And the electron pair geometry with two electron pairs is what's known as linear as well. Basically creates a linear arrangement. Now, something with two electron pairs and two bonds, taking both of those into account, will also give us a molecular geometry, our shape, as linear as well. And it will have a bond angle of 180 degrees there. And again, going from one atom to the next. So something with two electron pairs and two bonds will have a electron pair geometry of linear and will have a molecular geometry of linear as well. It's basically a straight line. Basically, they will line up in a straight line fashion. Any questions on that there? All right. The next sort of example is something where we have a central atom and three things attached. In this case, we are going to look at our central atom again, always the central atom. And we want to look at electron pairs and bonds around the central atom. And if we do that again, looking at it, we will see there are three electron pairs. And there is also three bonds in this case. And again, that's right here, one electron pair, two electron pairs, three electron pairs, and those are also bonds as well. So once again, it is the number of electron pairs that determine the electron pair geometry. So something with three electron pairs, the electron pair geometry is what is known as trigonal planar. which is also known as triangular, sometimes referred to. Now, something with three electron pairs and has three bonds, that is what is known for the molecular geometry, also as trigonal planar. The reason for that is pretty much it makes a triangle basically in three-dimensional space there so it makes a nice equilateral triangle it has a bond angle of 120 degrees so the electron pair geometry and the bond angle is based on how many electron pairs there are in the molecule so it's really the number of electron pairs in the molecule that determine both the electron pair geometry and the actual bond angle yeah Probably the easiest way because to do it is to pay attention to electron pairs and the bonds. And uh, there'll be a table. There's a table on Canvas now of it um, and know what geometries go with that. Because when you draw it, um, it's going to be two-dimensional, right? You're not going to draw it, right? You won't have the geometry drawn for you and all those things. So it'll just be drawn kind of like a square, basically, all of them. So number of electron pairs, number of bonds, best way to remember and just know the geometries that go with that, those combinations. Yeah. It's the bond angle between uh, the three, in this case, like between, it's like the bond angle from between the fluorine, the boron, you know, if you went that bond angle, basically, yeah. 
Other questions? <clears throat> okay, so uh, trigonal planar for both of them in this case. The next example that we will see is a situation where we have a central atom, four things attached. So once again, here looking at the central atom, electron pairs and number of bonds, which are really the two things you wanna look at, has four electron pairs and also four bonds. So once again, uh, that would be here, electron pair, electron pair, electron pair, and electron pair, and they're all bonds as well. Once again, something that has four electron pairs, the electron pair geometry is what is known as tetrahedral. Tetrahedron, if you're find an old book, but most people go with tetrahedral these days. Something with four electron pairs and a combination of four bonds means that the molecular geometry will also be tetrahedral as well. It will have a bond angle of 109.5. Oops, come back uh, here. And again, that's the bond angle in this case between the hydrogen, the carbon, and the hydrogen in this case. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Uh, most people go tetrahedral these days. Uh, years ago, they used to go tetrahedron, but uh, tetrahedral is good. All right. Uh, up to this point, what we have seen is the electron pair geometry name and the molecular geometry name. Have they been different or the same, the names? they have been the same. So the electron pair geometry name and the molecular geometry name has been the same. The reason they've been the same is if you look at the central atom and all those examples we just did, there are no dots. So there's no non-bonding electrons. So because they all have bonding electrons, uh, they're basically the same deal. The bonding electrons has the actual atom bonded to it. So because there's no non-bonding electrons, when you have no non-bonding electrons, on the central atom, both the electron pair geometry and the molecular geometry will be the same. So if you draw a Lewis structure and you have no dots on the central atom, both of those names should be the same, the electron pair geometry and molecular geometry, because there's only bonding electrons involved. It is only when we start introducing non-bonding electrons to the mix that we actually get a difference in the name. And the difference in the name actually comes to the molecular shape part. So the electron pair geometry name will be the same. The molecular geometry name will be different. And the reason they're different is because of the non-bonding electrons, they really don't want to be near bonding electrons. So they try to get away further. And because they're not involved in the bond, they have a little bit more room to move out. There's not that extra bond in the way that kind of locks everybody into place. So because they're non-bonding electrons, it gives a little bit more flexibility in the overall shape. So what we will start to see now is there will be some differences in the name and it will be only the molecular geometry name that will change. The electron pair geometry will not change. And really the degree of sort of the difference that we see is involved by what type of electrons get near each other. So really the best situation is like bonding electrons near bonding electrons. So kind of lines near lines on your Lewis structure. The next sort of worst situation is where you get some non-bonding electrons, some dots near some lines. They don't like to be near each other. And the worst, worst situation is when you get non-bonding electrons near other non-bonding electrons. They definitely do not want to be near each other. So they're able to actually get pretty far away from each other because, again, they're not locked into a bond. Um, and what that does is, obviously, as the electrons move, every, all the bonds will move accordingly, and the overall shape of the molecule will start to change in that particular case. <clears throat> So let's take a look at an example. This is SO2. 
which I guess I should draw. That would be good. Let me draw S O T here since it did not make it up. Looks something like this. So when we look at the central atom here, and again, that is the one we want to look at, which is this. The electron pairs that we have and the bonds, which are the two important things. Number of electron pairs around sulfur is how many? Doesn't matter if they're lines or dots. How many is that? It has one here. This is also an electron pair. And our double bond counts as only one. So there's essentially three electron pairs around this central atom. In terms of bonds, there are one here. And once again, the double bond will only count as one bond. So there will only be two bonds in this case. Everybody see how we count that there? <clears throat> now, as I mentioned before, the electron pair geometry does not change. So the electron pair geometry, as we saw earlier, something with three electron pairs means that it is still going to be trigonal planar. But now we have a couple of different interactions happening. We have bonding electrons near bonding electrons. We also have non-bonding electrons near bonding electrons. So what happens is, again, they want to get away from each other. So the overall shape of this molecule actually changes. And the molecular geometry, our shape, uh, will end up as, I go with angular. Uh, some people will use bent for this one, or bent angular. Uh, for the shape, we're going to go with angular, and we'll talk about why that is in a little bit in just a second. But for this type of arrangement, we are going to go with angular as the shape of it. Um, but don't be surprised, some people do use bent or bent angular as sort of the name for this sort of arrangement as well. The bond angle here is less than 120 degrees. So because it still has three uh, electron pairs, but we don't have three bonds like we do in a traditional trigonal planar, uh, we get a little less of a bond angle there. So it'll end up being about a little less than 120 degrees as the bond angle. Any questions on that one? <clears throat> The next sort of example that we're gonna look at is one where we have a central atom and three things attached. And now we're gonna look at the central atom here. And in terms of electron pairs and bonds, it has four electron pairs. So once again, doesn't matter if they're lines or dots, but that is one electron pair, two electron pairs, three electron pairs, and four electron pairs right there. In terms of bonds, it has only three bonds. So once again, it is the electron pair geometry here that is important for the, or the electron pairs is important for the electron pair geometry. So something with four electron pairs is still going to be tetrahedral for our electron pair geometries. We still have the same sort of deal here. We got some non-bonding electrons and bonding electrons. We have bonding electrons near bonding electrons. So what happens with our molecular geometry, our shape? Is we will get what is known as trigonal pyramid. And that is because you have these non-bonding electrons up there, makes like a triangle and then kind of a pyramidal shape at the bottom of it when it comes together in that sense. Again, here we have the non-bonding electrons near the bonding, which is not the greatest of situations. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> By the way, we'll take a moment here. This is trigonal pyramid, the shape. We also saw trigonal planar earlier. They are different. Yes, trigonal planar is three electron pairs and three bonds. Trigonal pyramid is four electron pairs and three bonds. You need to uh, commit to your answer. Yes, you cannot just write trigonal. <clears throat> 
Yes, because I don't know what it is. Do not let me choose because I will choose wrong with an X. Yes, so she's either a trigonal planar or trigonal pyramid. Or my other favorite is trigonal. It was, it was pyramid. You could clearly see her in pyramid, right? That's definitely what it looks like. Or maybe it was planar. I mean, that looks good. So uh, just don't lay up trigonal. You got to go trigonal pyramid or trigonal planar, depending on which one. Yes. Uh, trigonal planar is the one that we saw a few back there to have three electron pairs and three bonds. So it is, uh, yeah, it's right there. Yeah. It is. So it's got to have four electron pairs and three bonds. I don't know who asked that, but yeah, yeah, three electron pairs. And then again, so this was the one that we saw earlier. That is our sort of trigonal planar where it has the three bonds and three electron pairs. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and the last uh, geometry that you'll be responsible for this class, until you get to 1A, where there's a lot more geometries you'll talk about, is one where we have uh, a central atom here in terms of electron pairs, has four electron pairs, and in terms of bonds, has two bonds. And once again here, uh, in terms of electron pairs, we got one, two, three, and four. And obviously just the two bonds there between the hydrogens. So once again, something with four electron pairs, uh, we'll have a electron pair geometry of tetrahedral. It will have a molecular geometry of what we have here is really the worst case scenario. We have uh, bonding electrons near bonding, non-bonding near bonding, and we have non-bonding electrons near non-bonding electrons, which is like the worst case scenario. Uh, so what really happens here is those non-bonding electrons go, we're gonna try to get way far away from each other. The result of that is it pushes the bonds down near each other because that's semi-okay. And what it ends up giving is a geometry known as bent or V-shaped. And this is why we will use bent or V-shaped for this and really angular for the earlier one. The bond angle here will actually be less than 109.5 degrees. And by the way, on the previous one, it also has a bond angle of less than, on this one, a bond angle of less than 109.5 degrees. It's about a buck seven for this guy, and it's about a 104 there for water or so. Uh, so there is some differences in those bond angles because of the non-bonding electrons gives the molecule a little extra room to move around. <clears throat> Any questions on the geometries? The best way to do it really is memorization. So uh, I put a list up on Canvas of bonds and electron pairs and know which geometries go with it. Most people can't visualize it in three-dimensional space, myself included. So that's really the best way to learn the geometries. You do need to know them, both the electron pair geometry and the molecular geometry and the bond angles that go with these guys as well. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, no, I, I think it will be more so, it'll be a question, like an all-encompassing question of, frankly, draw the Lewis structure, uh, give the molecular geometry, the electron pair geometry, and the bond angles. And we'll talk about it in a second, is it polar or non-polar? That's pretty much going to be the question. Um, <clears throat> you should, if you understand sort of the bond angle, have an idea as to sort of uh, what it will be. Here's a table from your book or a similar table that kind of does it by electron pair arrangement and molecular structure, but basically number of electron pairs and bonds is really the best sort of way to memorize it uh, when you do it. Um, so let me take a look here. Let's just run through a few that we drew earlier. Uh, we drew this guy. I'm not going to put all the dots on the outside atoms. Uh, we'll do uh, uh, this guy. We'll do this guy. All right, there's a few that we did before. So for the CO2, what is the electron pair? How many electron pairs does it have around the central atom? Two. 
Electron pairs would be two and number of bonds would be two, which means the electron pair geometry would be two electron pairs and two bonds is linear. Yeah. And the molecular geometry would be, is there any dots on the central atom? So both of those names should be same. Yeah. So it would also be linear as well. Yeah. We look at the S here. How many electron pairs on this guy? It has four. Remember, we're counting dots, lines. Doesn't matter if they're double bonds or triple bonds. They all count as one, basically, when you're doing geometry. Bonds here would be, this would be two. So electron pair geometry for this guy would be, it would be tetrahedral. I'll just make a list here. For this is fun, tetrahedral. And because it does have those non-bonding electrons, we know the molecular geometry name should be different and something with four electron pairs, but only two bonds. It's going to be just like what we just saw with water. So this is going to be bent or V-shaped, yeah. Lastly here, the geometry of this guy should be. How many atoms are there? Anything with two atoms should be linear, yeah. As there's no central atom, right? Bond angle on the first one here should be about 180 degrees as it's linear. This guy will be less than 109.5 degrees. Yeah. So that really is the best way to draw a good Lewis structure, have that sort of chart memorized. And the easiest way is just electron pairs and bonds and what goes with them in terms of geometry and you'll be in good shape. Any questions on how to do it? Yeah. Yeah, so what they're actually asking for on the lab is shape, which is just the molecular geometry name. I'm going to have you actually do, I'll, I'll give you the heads up now, I'm going to have you actually include the electron pair geometry as well. So I want you to do them both. Uh, so identify them for the lab, electron pair geometry and molecular geometry. But technically what they were asking for where they say shape is the molecular geometry. So sometimes people call the molecular geometry the shape of the molecule. So yeah, in this case, it would be the uh, column there on the right that you would what you would put, yeah, like linear or bent, or, yeah, or tetrahedral, and depend on the molecule. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. Last thing we're going to talk about here is writing over that is uh, let's get rid of that stuff there. there we go. All right. So last thing we're going to talk about here in this chapter is uh, molecular polarity. So. Molecular polarity is when we look at the entire molecule as a whole, whether or not electrons are going to be shared equally or unequally. We talked about bond polarity using electronegativity values. And if you remember, if there is a polar bond, there's a side that's more positive and there's a side that's more negative in that bond. And the same thing happens with the molecule as a whole. If the molecule is polar, there will be a side to that molecule that's more positive. And there'll be a side that's more negative as a result of unequal sharing of electrons over the entire molecule. And we actually represent what is referred to as a dipole moment with that same arrow, where again, it always points to the more negative side and this side is the more positive side. If it is a polar molecule, it will have what is known as a dipole moment. And a dipole moment is just that, it's really you know a side of the molecule that's more negative and a side that's more positive. Nonpolar molecules will not have a dipole moment. They're essentially neutral, if you want to think about it. They kind of share electrons perfectly equal over the entire molecule. So there is no side of the molecule that's more positive. There's no side that's more negative. It's sort of a, a neutral, for lack of a better word, and they will not have it. So if somebody has a dipole moment, definitely a polar molecule. And again, you can represent it by that same arrow. The absolute easiest ones to determine whether or not the molecule is polar or nonpolar is when you're dealing with diatomic molecules, which means they only have two atoms. So for example, if we have H2, we would expect based on bond polarity and electronegativity values, should these electrons be shared equally or unequally? Yeah, which means this is really a nonpolar bond, right? And because in this particular molecule, that is the only bond we have, 
that means that it has to share the electrons equally over the whole molecule. It would end up being a nonpolar molecule. Now, if we had something like HF that we saw earlier, right? That bond polar or nonpolar? That bond is polar where it is heading towards the fluorine being more electronegative. And since this has a polar bond, and once again, that is the only bond in the entire molecule, that means then that molecule has to be a polar molecule as well. So the easiest ones to determine whether or not the molecule is polar or nonpolar is a diatomic molecule because frankly, it's the same as the bond polarity. So if the bond is polar, then the molecule will be polar. And if the bond is nonpolar, then the molecule will be a nonpolar molecule. Any questions on diatomic molecules? So this guy here would be polar or nonpolar, this guy? It would be nonpolar. It doesn't matter if it's double bond or triple bond. That's going to have a nonpolar bond, and that's the only bond, so it's going to be a nonpolar molecule. Now, when we get into three or more atoms, it gets a little bit more tricky. You have to look at two things. First off, are there polar bonds? And if the answer is no, then it's a nonpolar molecule. If the answer is yes, it may be polar, it may not be polar, so it depends. The second thing that you have to look at is the molecular geometry or the shape. So <clears throat> if we look at something like carbon dioxide, which we drew before, is the bond between carbon and oxygen polar or nonpolar? Carbon and oxygen is in the same row on the periodic table. Oxygen is further to the right. So should it be a polar or nonpolar bond? Should mean oxygen is more electronegative, right? It's further to the right, which means it should be polar. So there are polar bonds and they would be heading towards the oxygen in this case on each side. So this guy does have polar bonds. Now, because it has polar bonds, you may think that it is going to be a polar molecule, but we do need to look at the geometry and we just did it. The molecular geometry of this guy is linear, two electron pairs and two bonds. Because of the geometry, this is actually going to be a nonpolar molecule. And that is because if you think about the geometry, which is basically a straight line, like this pencil, I have oxygen pulling this way, but yet I have oxygen pulling the other way, right? And they essentially cancel each other out. It's kind of like pulling on a rope, right? Equally, like a tug of war, right? The little thing is not going to go anywhere. So even though it does have polar bonds, because of the geometry, they will cancel each other out. Yes. It would not. In this situation, right? In this situation, if we had them with the same linear geometry, right? Heading in the same direction they would also cancel each other out. You can think of like a swinging door, right? Two people on opposite sides of a swinging door pushing equally. Door is going to go nowhere, right? It's not going to open. Then it would be polar, right? Because it's like pulling on the rope and everybody's one's pulling and the other guy's pulling with them, right? So sometimes people think of it like pulling on a rope and if you kind of pull and it's going to move, then it's going to be polar. If you kind of pull or push, and it's going to kind of cancel each other out, then it'll be nonpolar. There'll be no movement. That's the way people look at it. those little dipole arrows. These are what are referred to as vectors. Yes, they have direction, they have magnitude. And then I fell asleep in physics, but I woke up long enough to remember that in some cases they do add to each other, and in other cases they kind of cancel each other out. And that's what really we're looking at here in terms of this. So it is possible, as you see here, to have a molecule that has polar bonds but that is actually nonpolar as a result of geometry. So you have to look at those two things when you have three or more atoms involved. Now, if we take something like water, is it a polar bond between hydrogen and oxygen? Yes. 
It is. There's going to be oxygen being more electronegative, so it's going to point this way and this way. And so it does have polar bonds. The geometry here we just did, which is bent or V-shaped, which is sort of how I draw, drew it there. In this particular case, the geometry is such like this that they're both actually heading in the same direction. Kind of think of them meeting at the top and like pulling, and the whole thing would pull from the top. And it would be a polar molecule. Because of that, they're going to actually add to each other in this case. And you would have a net dipole moment that would head in this direction where the oxygen side of water would become more negative and the hydrogen side of water would be more positive. By the way, if you're curious, it's a little uh, head to tail type of thing on your uh, vectors. And that's how you get your net dipole moment heading in that direction coming through there. So you kind of put them head to tail, yeah. It would be. So let's talk about a much easier way to figure out polar or nonpolar, because frankly, who wants to draw a vector? Nobody wants to draw vectors, right? You still need to know how to draw the arrows in case you're asked to draw the bond dipole. But there are certain geometries which are considered symmetrical geometries, and there are certain geometries which are considered unsymmetrical geometries. So in our case, <coughs> excuse me, some symmetrical geometries which would be uh, trigonal, planar, and tetrahedral. And we're talking about the molecular geometries here. And what these have in common is if you look at the central atom in your Lewis structure, there's no dots, no lone pairs. And if you have no dots on the central atom and all the outside atoms are the same, it will be a nonpolar molecule in most cases. <laughs> so, for example, if I took uh, this guy and I want to draw all the dots on the fluorine, when I look at this guy on my Lewis structure, I have no dots on the central atom. All the atoms on the outside are the same, polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar. Yeah. Now, let's say I switch out, and they do have polar bonds, obviously, right? They're all heading towards the fluorine. They're basically all canceling out. They're equal and opposites of each other. If I take out one of the fluorines and replace it with a hydrogen, now in this case, I still have polar bonds heading towards these guys. Polar or nonpolar in this case. It will become polar in this case because you have the three fluorines that are pulling, right? Hydrogen is now nonpolar, just kind of going along for the ride. And actually, carbon is a little bit more electronegative, so it's kind of heading in the same direction. And it will become polar in this case. So if you have one of these symmetrical geometries where you have no dots on your Lewis structure and everybody on the outside is the same, it will be nonpolar in the molecule. Pretty safe bet. If you have a symmetrical geometry where there's no dots and everybody on the outside is not the same, it's most likely going to be a polar molecule. So that's a really quick way to sort of figure that out. That leaves us our unsymmetrical geometries. <clears throat> which uh, basically for our purposes is trigonal pyramid. Bent are V-shaped, are angular. What all these have in common are there are dots on the central atom, which are non-bonding electrons. And if everything on the outside is the same atom, it will be a polar molecule. So like our water that we saw earlier, right? I see dots on the central atom. I see everybody on the outside is the same. It's going to be polar. And that's pretty much a good deal. That pretty much just leaves linear, which is a pretty easy one to figure out because it's a straight line. So as was the earlier question, if they're going opposite of each other, they will cancel and be nonpolar. If they're heading right at each other, it will be nonpolar. 
uh, if they're going in the same direction, then it would be polar. So that's a pretty straightforward one to sort of figure out. You can think of it like pulling on a rope or pushing the rope. Um, that's a good way to do it. <laughs> Question on that there. So let's take a look at some of those that we drew earlier. Uh, so we had, uh, I'll just draw up some here really quick. Uh, All right, so let's see here. Let's go at this one here, polar or nonpolar? Polar, all I have to do is see dots and I see everybody the same, should be a polar molecule. Polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar, no dots, everybody on the outside is the same. Nonpolar based on geometry. And lastly, the guy on the bottom, polar, I see dots, everybody on the outside is not the same. R is the same, so it should be polar in this case. Yeah. What about this guy? Nonpolar. There's no dots. Everyone on the outside is uh, the same. By the way, there's not no, there's no polar bonds either, right? In this one, they're all nonpolar. So, uh, any questions on molecular polarity? Yeah. So probably the best way to do it is just the simple dots, no dots type of thing is a really good, easy, quick way to do it. Any questions on bonding? That should finish up chapter 12, I believe. <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, we're going to continue on now to a little bit of nomenclature. Just give me a second to get it going here. Okay, so we're coming back here, I believe it's five, I want to say off the top of my head. We're going to talk about nomenclature, so we're going to talk about how to name everything here, and let us get into that here. So first off, there are some things that are usually just named by common names. Uh, so H2O is water, and that is how you should refer to it. Not a trick question. You don't need to lay up like some dihydrogen monoxide. Nobody wants a refreshing glass of dihydrogen monoxide. They would much have a glass of water. Uh, NH3 is ammonia. CH4 is methane, which is basically what lights your Bunsen burner, comes out of the gas there. Um, I would say for the most part, those three, you should go by common names. A lot of people here will just call that sodium chloride and, and so forth. So really those three, you should kind of know and call by those names. So water, H2O, ammonia, which is NH3 and methane, which is CH4. <clears throat> so there's two types of compounds we're gonna talk about naming and it revolves around the bonding. When we have compounds that are metals and non-metals, those are gonna be ionic compounds. And what we know about ionic compounds is it is always a metal and a non-metal. And what happens as we talked about is we're going to get a transfer of electrons from the metal to the non-metal. That is gonna create our cation, which is positively charged, and our anion, which is negatively charged. The other type of bonding, our naming we're gonna talk about involves two non-metals, which are covalent compounds. And sometimes people call them molecular compounds. And that is where we have the sharing of electrons like we talked about. So we're going to first sort of focus on ionic compounds here. And I think we talked about it, but just in case we didn't, on the periodic table, there are certain things that have sort of fixed charges. Uh, so everybody in group one on the periodic table will be a plus one charge. Everybody in group two will be a plus two charge. Uh, over, we'll skip over here a little bit. Uh, group three will be plus three, which is really aluminum, is who we're talking about there. We skip group four. Then at group five is going to be minus three, which is the nonmetals. Group six is going to be minus two, which is, again, the nonmetals. And I'll add to my periodic table here. Group seven will be minus one. So it goes kind of plus one, plus two, skip the transition metals. Uh, plus three at aluminum, and then skip group four and goes backwards with the non-metals like we're nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, 
uh, minus 5, minus 3, I'm sorry, minus 5, minus 3, minus 2, and minus 1 for group 5, 6, and 7. Transition metals, as we'll talk about, can have multiple positive charges. So in this particular case, there are three transition metals that will have a fixed charge. So <clears throat> that is silver, which will always be plus one. That is uh, zinc, which will always be plus two. And that is cadmium, which will always be plus three. They're right around here on the periodic table in the transition metal region. Now, everybody else in that transition metal region and also kind of below the staircase. So remember, the staircase kind of comes through here. Everybody else in this region and below the staircase, uh, they are metals that could have a variety of charges. So in some cases, they could be plus two. Other cases, they could be plus three. Uh, but those guys have fixed charges. So once again, our fixed charge is group one plus one, group two plus two, aluminum plus three, and then starting in group five, minus three for our nonmetals, minus two in group six, and minus one in group seven. Any questions on that? <clears throat> okay. So binary ionic compounds contain for an ionic compound. Ionic compounds are broken up into two types, a type one and a type two compound. Type one, as we'll talk about, has metals that are fixed positive charges. Type two ionic compounds have metals that can have a variable charges. When we talk about a positive ion and negative ion, which I think we touched upon in an earlier chapter, if it is a cation, we simply just use the whole name of it. So again, if we had Na+, plus, and that was all that we had, it is a metal, so we would just use the whole name, which would be the sodium ion. If we had Ca2+, plus, this would be the calcium ion. And if you remember, the negative guys get the IDE at the end of them. So the negative anions end with the IDE. So instead of nitrogen, this becomes the nitride IDE ion. Instead of oxygen, this becomes the oxide IDE ion. So positive ions, two things. If you have to write the formula for the ion, it should have the charge. And if you're just naming the ions by themselves, uh, you basically use the whole name of the element for anything that's positive, And you use IDE at the end for anybody that's negative. You drop the last part of the name as well. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> now, hydrogen is the only one that really can kind of go both ways. Uh, if you had H plus, that is hydrogen ion. But hydrogen actually can go negative as well. Negative one, although it looks like two. Uh, so that would be what is known as the hydride ID ion. So hydrogen is the only element that could kind of go both ways, be positive in certain situations. But if you have a hydrogen that comes after a metal, it will actually be negatively charged. And that is a hydride. <clears throat> so type one compounds, and whenever you are dealing with ionic compounds, the most important thing in the ionic compound is always the metal. Non-metal doesn't really care. It's always the metal that determines how you should name that ionic compound. So in a type one compound, we will have guys that have fixed charges. And that means that is our group one, two, and three are zinc, cadmium, are silver. So if you see any of those metals in a ionic compound from group one, two, three, are for zinc, cadmium, or silver, you know it's a type one compound. You know it has a fixed charge. And frankly, all you have to do is name it just like we just talked about. You use the whole name of the metal, 
and IDE on the nonmetal, and that is it. Type two compounds are metals that really come from the transition metals and just to the right of the transition metals underneath the staircase. Those are guys that can have multiple charges. So these are typically our transition metals. Are just to the right. So once again, what we're talking about here are transition metals and underneath the staircase, basically, our metals, things where lead is, PB, our tin, our antimony, those guys are metals and you can have variable type of charges. The difference between them is you need to figure out what the charge is on the metal and then that's gonna be incorporated into the actual naming. So in an ionic compound, most importantly, always the metal is the most important thing. So all these are ionic compounds. And again, that's a metal and a non-metal. And again, it is the metal that is the most important to look at. <clears throat> questions on that so far so some examples of type two like chromium in certain cases chromium can be plus two other cases chromium could be plus three and same thing with copper in certain cases it could be copper with a plus one charge and in certain cases it could be the copper with a plus two charge So here's a table similar to one you got in your book. Again, these are all positive cations. They are all just using the element name. And our guys here that are negative, they all get the IDE treatment at the end of the name. Some you take out more of the name than others. And, you know, you just kind of kind of get a feel for what the names would be. Uh, again, like chloride, bromide, iodide, uh, fluoride, sulfide. And again, you can see hydrogen is really kind of the only one that will go kind of negative or positive. Probably in most cases, again, hydrogen will be positive. The only time hydrogen, again, is negative if it comes after a metal like LiH. That would be lithium hydride. This would be a lithium ion and a hydrogen ion. The other important thing that we talked about as well is whenever we put a positive guy right and a negative guy together, the overall charge needs to equal zero, right? So a reminder, we took uh, K plus and S2 minus and put them together. The correct formula here should be K2S. That's because we need two of these positive ones. That gives us a plus two overall to balance out the minus two overall. So you always want to put it together in the simplest way when you have a positive ion and a negative ion that equals zero. You had something like aluminum and oxygen. Common number between these two is six, which means to get aluminum to six, you need two of them. To get oxygen to six, you need three of them, which means the proper formula here would look something like this. So a reminder that when we do write the formula for an ionic compound, the actual formula should have no charges, but they are made up of two things that are ions. So that's an important distinction. If you're asked to write the cation, then it should have a charge. If you're asked to write just the anion, it should have a charge. But when you put the cation and anion together, it should equal zero and no charge in that formula. Any questions on that? <clears throat> Okay, so let us get into type one. So type one is pretty good. It's uh, not too bad. It is always a metal and a non-metal, which is ionic. And we're going to look at that metal like we talked about, and it's going to be once again from group one, two, or three, our silver, zinc, or cadmium. And to name it, we use the whole name of the metal and the non-metal gets the IDE treatment at the end of it. And that is it. So let's take a look at this one. That is K2S. K is a metal, which is potassium. 
S is sulfur, which is a non-metal. Where do we find K on the periodic table? K is in group number one, which means it has a fixed charge. And that's all you need to know. It's a type one. So we go whole name of K, which is potassium. Sulfur gets the IDE treatment and it is potassium sulfide. Doesn't matter if there's two of them, there could be 40 of them. You still would be called potassium. You do not use any prefixes with type one compounds. So it is potassium sulfide. How about this one that we just did? What should that one be called? It should, because aluminum is group three, which means it has a fixed charge. It's type one. That's all you need to worry about. And you use the whole name there, which is aluminum. And then oxide on the bottom. Once again, does not matter that there's multiple ions there. You do not use prefixes. Yeah. Uh, this would be what would that be called? CA is calcium, which is a metal. F is fluorine, which is a non-metal. Calcium, it would be calcium fluoride. Calcium is group two, means it has a fixed charge. It's a type one compound. So this would be calcium fluoride. Now, again, although the formula does not have a charge, it is made up of a cation, which is a calcium ion, right? And also the anion here would be only F minus. It would not be F2 minus or anything like that. It would actually be F minus is the anion. Yeah. Any questions on type one there? All right. So again, a reminder, when we do write that formula, we want to make sure that it equals zero. And although it does not have charges in the compound formula, it does represent two ions. And again, in this case, potassium iodide. The cation would be K plus. The anion formula would be I minus. So again, if you're asked to write the formulas for the anion and cation, as I did right there on the right, you should include the charges. If you're asked to write the formula for potassium iodide, you should write it like this with no charge, just Ki. And again, in this case, we have a plus one and a minus one. So we just need one of each. So we're good to go. Yeah. Any questions on that? <clears throat> All right. So why don't you take a second here and name these guys? We'll talk about it. <clears throat> okay. Let's take a look and see how you're doing. So here we have potassium, which is a metal, and chlorine, which is a non-metal, which means it's ionic. When we look at the metal, which is the important thing, we see that it is in group one, which means it has a fixed charge, which tells us it's a type one compound. And that means we just could just roll into the name here. So we're going to use the whole name of it, which is potassium. And the chlorine will now become chloride. So that is potassium chloride in this case. Over here, we got zinc, which is a metal. We have sulfur, which is a non-metal. Zinc is actually a transition metal, but it is one of those three that actually has a fixed charge. So zinc will always be plus two. So it really does fall under a type one compound. And that means that this should just be zinc sulfide, IDE. The cation here is zinc with a plus two charge. The anion is sulfur with a minus two charge, uh, just like the cation up here is our potassium with a plus one charge and our anion with a minus one charge. Coming here, we look at calcium, which is a metal and Br, which is a non-metal. Once again, that calcium is a type one metal as it's group number two, has a fixed charge. So this is gonna be calcium bromide again, does not matter that number. Don't put a prefix because it will be wrong. Yeah, so it is calcium bromide. And again, the cation here is calcium with a plus two charge. Anion is 
bromine, which is group seven, which looks like that, with just a minus one charge is the correct one. Lastly here, barium is a metal. Hydrogen is actually a non-metal. So this case, this is going to be barium because it's group two and a type one. Hydride, as this means that hydrogen is actually negative in this case. Yes, sir. It has to equal zero and the simplest way to equal zero. Yeah. So there's many ways you can get to equal zero, but you want to always do it in the simplest way to get to zero. The purpose of that was what we were talking about with bonding and the, the ionic compounds at the beginning. That gets everybody to the noble gas configuration by accepting electrons. And that's the purpose of it. Yeah. But it does have to be the simplest way to get to zero. Yeah. Uh, cation and the anion here actually would be negative one in this case. Yeah question on any of those <clears throat> okay let's then talk about the other type which is type 2 compounds now type 2 compounds are a little bit different in a couple of ways but not so different they are still ionic they are still a metal and a non-metal and it is still the metal that is the most important here and the metal here will be a transition metal or it will be just to the right. So this will be a transition metal. R to the right. And the important part about that is the metal can have variable charge, a variable positive charge. So we still name it the same way. We still use the whole name of the metal. So we're still going to use the whole name of the metal. We're still going to do the non-metal with the IDE at the end. The additional thing we're going to put in the middle is a Roman numeral. And a Roman numeral is going to indicate the positive charge on the metal. So if you took one of the metals out, what is the positive charge on the metal? So for example, here we have FeCl2. That is a metal, which is iron, and Cl is a non-metal. When we look at the metal, it is the dead center of the transition metal region. So that should tell you it's a type two compound. So you may not know what the charge is at this point, but the good news is you will always know the charge on whatever it's attached to. So in this case, it's attached to a chlorine. And chlorine is group seven, which means it has what type of charge? Minus one is group seven, right? So it's got a minus one charge. And there are two of them, right? which means our overall negative charge in this case is minus two. That means the iron here to balance it out needs to be plus two. So the way that we would go about naming this, as it says there, this would be iron. Roman numeral two for the charge, not how many you have, but the charge on one individual metal. And even though you have two of the CLs, it is still chloride. So that would be iron to chloride. That means that this guy would be what? Once again, it's a metal and a non-metal. Iron is a transition metal, which means it's type two. In this case, though, we have not two Cl minuses, but three, which means the positive charge here should be, to balance it out, plus three, right? So this would be iron Roman numeral three, chloride. And again, for the charge. So because this could have variable positive charges, the metals in this case, you need to include the Roman numeral to tell somebody we're talking about the plus two version of it in this case. We're talking about the plus three version in this case. Everything else is pretty much the same. You don't use prefixes or anything like that in these names. Any questions on that there? So if we had, say, this guy, what would the proper name? PB is lead, by the way. So I got a couple. So we got lead oxide. 
we got lead two oxide and we got lead four oxide. All right, let's see here. So first off, lead is a metal. Oxygen is a non-metal, which means it's ionic. Now, lead is not a transition metal, but it is one of those ones that are underneath the staircase that are still metals and can have a variety of charges. So because there are still metals under there where lead is, tin, and all those guys, they could have a variety of charges, which means they are type two compounds. So in this case, we're not sure what the lead is, but we do know that oxygen is group number six on the periodic table, which means it should have a minus two charge. And there's not just one oxygen there, but there are two, which means my grand total of negative charge is how much? Negative four. That means the lead here needs to be plus four to balance it out. So that is the correct one. Lead, Roman numeral four, because of the charge offside. Now, if you remember earlier, maybe the other day we were talking about sometimes people learn like, hey, move the charge up and down or move the subscript up and down to get the correct charge. Again, it does not work in all cases. Uh, it will work in 90 some odd percent of the case. If you just kind of randomly flip those things back and forth, you would end up with probably lead to oxide. Uh, which would be incorrect in this case. So sometimes best, even though it's kind of silly to draw it out, you can visually see the charges and just make sure that they equal each other. It's a really good way to kind of do it. So type two ionic compounds have metals and non-metals. Metals are important. They could have a var variety of positive charge. You need to first figure out what the positive charge is on the metal, include the Roman numeral. Everything else is the same. And once again, no prefixes on the steel. Yeah. Any questions on type two guys? Yeah. All right, we will lay it up there for today, I think.